One of the fundamental principles in reinforced concrete design is the effective bond between the concrete and the reinforcing steel. Without proper bonding, the steel can't contribute its full strength, and the composite action we rely on in RC structures simply breaks down. In today's lecture, we're going to take a detailed look at how this bond is achieved and maintained, specifically through development length, hooks, and lap splicing. We'll discuss how these are treated in the code, the logic behind the provisions, and how they apply in practical design scenarios such as beam anchorage, rebar terminations, and bar splicing. Understanding these concepts is essential if you want your design to behave safely and reliably under load. Let's begin. Before we dive into the details, I want to emphasize why anchorage matters. Because in practice, even if you size your beams and columns correctly, if you mess up the anchorage, the structure can still fail. Think about this. You could have a perfectly designed beam, correct flexural capacity, enough shear reinforcement, proper detailing. But if the rebar slips out because it wasn't developed properly into the support, all that design work means nothing. You've got a brittle failure and there's no warning. This is especially critical in seismic zones or heavily loaded structures where demand on anchorage is very high. Anchors, hooks, lap splices, they're not extra details. They're what keep the rebar connected to the structure when it's trying to pull away. Anchorage refers to the way forces in reinforcing bars are safely transferred to the surrounding concrete so that the bars can fully develop their strength without slipping or pulling out. To fully develop means allowing the rebar to reach its yield strength, the point where it can carry the maximum stress it was designed for before any failure like slipping occurs. This is achieved through methods like providing enough bond development length using standard hooks or applying lap splicing. In other words, these are the tools we use to make sure the rebar stays anchored where it matters most. Development length refers to the minimum length of reinforcing bar that must extend beyond a point of peak stress to ensure the bar can fully develop its strength without slipping. These points of peak stress are often called critical sections. They typically occur where the bending moment is highest or where adjacent reinforcement ends. To maintain structural integrity, adequate development length or anchorage must be provided on both sides of these critical sections to safely transfer the forces between the steel and the concrete. Development length is classified into section as per code. Let's begin with the development length required for tension reinforcement. The formula for tension reinforcement according to the provision of NSCPC 101, section 425.4.2.3 is as shown. Notice that the value of length is directly proportional to the diameter of the rebar, dB, multiplied by different factors. And the value of the length is expected to be equal or greater than 300 mm, let us discuss the different factors. Starting with the lambda factor, also known as the modification factor for lightweight, or the lightweight modification factor. This factor reflects the lower tensile strength of lightweight aggregate concrete. A lower tensile strength results in a reduction of splitting resistance. To account for this, the code stipulates that the value factor for lightweight concrete is 0.75 or if FCT is given we solve for the value of lambda. And for normal weight, the value of lambda is 1. Note that the 0.56 square root of FCM is the average measured splitting tensile strength of normal weight concrete. Next, the casting location factor psi t is the factor that reflects the adverse effects that can occur to the top reinforcement in a member. During the placement of concrete, water and mortar migrate vertically through the member and collect on the underside of the reinforcing bars. It has been shown that the bond between concrete and steel can be weakened because of the presence of mortar, where the depth of concrete cast below the bars exceeds 300 millimeters. If the rebar is placed on top of 300 millimeters of fresh concrete, the factor is 1.3, while for other conditions, the value is 1. Next, the reinforcement coating factor psi E is the factor that accounts for the reduced bond strength between concrete and epoxy coated or zinc and epoxy dual coated reinforcing bars. The coating prevents adhesion and friction between the bar and the concrete. In cases where the rebar is coated and the cover to the coated bars is small, where clear cover is less than three times the bar diameter, or where the clear spacing between the bars is less than six times the bar diameter, splitting failure can occur, and the anchorage or bond strength is substantially reduced. Thus, in these situations, the factor is 1.5. On the other hand, if the cover or clear spacing is greater than these limits, splitting failure is avoided and the factor may be taken as 1.2. This accounts for the reduced bond strength due to the coating. For uncoated and zinc-coated galvanized bars, the factor is 1. 
Note that the code stipulates that the product of the casting location factor and coding factor need not be greater than 1.7. This limit takes into consideration that the bond of coded bars is already reduced because of the loss of adhesion between the bars and the concrete. The reinforcement size factor Psi S reflects the more favorable performance of smaller diameter reinforcement. For 20 mm diameter and smaller deformed bars and wires, the factor is 0.8 whereas for larger bars the factor is 1. For the secondary quantities, such as the spacing or cover dimension CB, the code defines it as the smaller of the distance from the center of the bar or wire being developed to the nearest concrete surface and The transverse reinforcement index KTR represents the role of confining reinforcement across potential splitting planes. Larger amounts of confining reinforcement reduce the potential for splitting failure, thus reducing the overall required development length of the reinforcement. KTR can be computed as 40 times the total cross-sectional area of all confining reinforcement within a spacing that crosses the potential plane of splitting through the reinforcement being developed over the product of S and the number of bars or wires being developed across the plane of splitting. Because the presence of confining reinforcement has the potential to decrease development length, it is conservative to take the value as zero. The entire value of the quantity CB plus KTR divided by DB cannot be less than 2.5. If the value exceeds 2.5, there's a tendency for the rebar to experience pull-out failure. Also, the quantity, the square root of the specified compressive strength, cannot exceed 8.3 MPa. In order not to overestimate the tensile capacity, in other words, if the value is more than 8.3, we use 8.3 instead. The factors were summarized under section 425.4.2.4 of the code in case you are interested in comparing it the provisions of ACI 318. Here is my version of the summary. Alternatively, the code has also presented an alternative approach under 425.4.2.2. For the development length for compression, there's not much to discuss because the procedure is quite similar with tension, but using different formula. The development length for compression LDC is the larger between number 1.24 times Fy times Psi R also known as confinement modification factor divided by lambda square root of Fc prime times dB and number 2.043 of Psi R times dB. We'll talk about Psi R in a sec. Now hook development length is quite similar with tension and compression but for hooks we'll have to account for additional values such as bend length and extension length. The code provided us with a separate provision for tension main bars and secondary bars. For the standard hook used for the tension main reinforcement, two provision must be considered 90 and 180 degrees hook. The total length for of the rebar is made up of the hook development length, LDH, the bend length defined by the diameter D and the extension length. The value of D is the same for both angles, 6, 8 and 10 times dB for increasing bar diameters, while for the extension we use 12 times dB for 90 degree and the greater value between 4 times dB or 65 mm for 180 degree hook. For secondary reinforcement hooks, like for ties, stirrups or hoops, there will be an additional provision for 135 hook. The length is still comprising of the LDH bend and extension, but with slight modification to the values as compared to standard main bar hooks. The formula for LDH is similar to LD and LDC. Lambda will still be the same for lightweight and normal weight concrete. Next is Psi E, the reinforcement coding factor. This is like what we have in tension development length, but ignoring small concrete cover or less rebar spacing. Therefore, the values are just 1.2 and 1. The reinforcement cover factor Psi C accounts for the amount of increased cover on one or more sides of a hook. The factor may be taken as 0.7 when one or both of the following conditions are applicable. Number 1 for 36 mm bar and smaller hooks, where the side cover normal to the plane of the hook is 65 mm or greater, and number 2 90 degree hooks where the cover on the bar extension beyond the hook is 50 mm or greater. In all other cases, the factor is 1. So here is the reinforcement confining factor Psi R. This accounts for the fact that confinement at or near the bend portion of a hooked bar can have a beneficial impact on development length. The values shall be 0.8, 0.9, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0.18, 0.19, 0.20, 0.21, 0.22, 0
when ties are perpendicular, and one for other conditions. Here is the summary for the provisions for hook under 425.4.3.2. You may compare this with the provision of ACI 318. Let's have a look at how we do development length for flexure. This diagram shows how flexural reinforcement is anchored in a continuous beam. The top bars over the supports resist negative bending, while the bottom bars at mid-span resist positive bending. You'll notice that bars aren't just placed at moment critical zones. They're also extended beyond cutoff points to satisfy development length requirements. At points of inflection, even though the moment is zero, bars are still anchored past those points to ensure they develop their full strength and prevent failure. The layout follows code rules for bar extension, splicing, and anchorage, making sure the reinforcement behaves as intended under load. So far, we've looked at how bars are extended or hooked to develop their strength. But what happens when a bar isn't long enough to reach its required length, or when we need to continue reinforcement across a longer span? That's where splicing comes in. Splicing is the method we use to connect two reinforcing bars so they act as one. And just like anchorage, it needs to be done properly to make sure there's no weak point in the structure. Let's talk about the types of splices, when they're used, and how to determine the required lap length. Now, when it comes to splicing reinforcement, there are a few ways to do it. And the method you choose depends on the structural demand, the site conditions, and sometimes even the contractor's preference. The most common is the lap splice. This is where you simply overlap two bars over a specified length so that the force transfers through bond between the steel and the concrete. Then we have mechanical splices. These use couplers or mechanical connectors to physically join two bars end to it. And these are useful in congested areas or when bar lengths are limited. And finally, there's welded splicing where the bars are fused together by welding. This method requires skilled labor and strict quality control, so it's typically reserved for special cases like precast or seismic applications. Each of these methods has its own code requirements, and they all aim to do one thing, make sure the force transfers smoothly from one bar to the next without creating a weak point in the system. In a lap splice, the bars are generally in contact over a specified length and are wired together. This is commonly referred to as a contact lap splice. The force in one bar is transferred to the surrounding concrete by bond, which subsequently transfers it to the adjoining bar. Splitting cracks can occur at the ends of a splice. In general, the following should be considered when specifying lap splices. First, provide splices at locations away from maximum stress or maximum bending moment. And second, stagger the location of splices wherever possible. The required lap splice length depends on the tension development length of the bars, the area of reinforcement provided over the length of the splice, and the percentage of reinforcement that is spliced at any one location. Lap splices in tension are classified as Class A or Class B. The length of the lap splice is given as a multiple of the tension development length LD, Note that class of splice length is LD, but must be greater than or equal to 300 mm. And class B splice length is 1.3 times LD, but must be greater than or equal to 300 mm. This diagram shows how we arrange and splice top reinforcement and interior beams, beams that are not along the perimeter of the structure. First, notice that the top bars are spliced, but not directly over the supports. The code tells us to move the splice away from high moment zones, usually into the middle third of the span, where stresses are lower. At each splice, at least one fourth of the original bar area AS over four should be continued through. This helps ensure that the bars are still properly anchored. You'll also see extra top bars added in the mid-span area. These are for shrinkage and temperature control and they're spaced based on the span length, not more than 0.125 times the span. Lastly, bars near the supports must extend at least LN over 4 or LN over 3 into the adjacent span, depending on whether it's an end or interior span. All of this is about one thing making sure that the bars are either properly developed or safely spliced so the beam performs as expected under load. That's it for the discussion. Next, we'll dive into some examples to see how all of this applies in actual design. If you found this lecture helpful, feel free to check out the other videos. Don't forget to like, subscribe, or share. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future topics, feel free to leave a comment below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.